stupidest thing I have ever seen. You know, somebody do, I can't believe it. So I walked him to the barn. At that time, I got all of the junk off of him, all the brick stuff, all that junk, everything down off of the walls, all the fancy bits and stuff, and took him to the burn barrel and burned him. And I decided that day, if I could not have a train a horse with a, with a snaffle bit, just a mild snaffle bit, then I would never climb on another one. And that moment is really what changed my thinking in horse training. Hope that you guys are all doing beautiful this morning. I wanted to introduce you to a longtime mentor of mine, Mr. John Lyons, America's most trusted horseman. <laughs> Ta -da! Um, how are you doing this morning? I am doing great. It's a beautiful day out there, isn't it? You know, it is for sure. Perfect. So I know we chatted a little bit before and I definitely want to get all of the parts of what you're doing now integrated into the chat, but I want to start at the beginning and the question that I ask all of my guests, because I feel like sometimes people know what they've seen through books and videos and over the years of clinics, but they don't know how it started for the trainers. So how you came into horses, either you're born into it or, you know, you got into it later. What did that story look like? Well, I think there would be uh, two parts, Amber. I think it would be like when I was a uh, young kid, I think I was in maybe fifth, sixth grade. And for some reason, this idea came into me, you know, got to me, uh, saw this horse in the pasture, went out you know, climbed on this horse and started riding it. So then I started, it might, so that I was kind of, a, I started as a horse thief, really, you could say. <laughs> and, you know, I'm stealing this horse out of the pasture. And, and it took about three days for my parents in the school to figure out what I was doing. So <laughs> my horse stealing career didn't last very long, but that's basically it. And then about the time when I was 24 years old, I was living in Kansas City, and uh, I bought a really nice, uh, pretty five acres. And uh, for some reason, the, and I was going to build a really nice house on it and stuff. And so, for some reason, this idea came into my head, and I have no idea where it came from. But uh, that anybody that had that much land ought to have a horse. So I went out, you know, and in the paper, didn't know anything about him, nothing. And um, I found this horse, and it was a, uh, a grade gilding. It was $350. It seemed to be, you know, reasonably rope to ride. The people could ride it, it looked like. And, <laughs> um, and, and, and the horse came with a saddle, a bridle, and a tack box, you know, uh, for $350. Bucks. So... So then about, oh, I don't know, two, three, four, five weeks later, I don't remember, uh, but I was driving down the road and I saw this guy just flying on this horse down the, down the road. And I pulled off the road and crossed the road over in front of him and I asked him, I said, what kind of horse is that? And he said, well, it's a Tennessee Walker. And I said, geez, how much would a horse like that be worth? He said, 500 bucks. And I said, I'll take it. And he says, no, you won't. You have to... You just follow me up to my house up here, up to this road in this house, and you show me you can ride it, you can you can buy it. So those two things started, those two horses started my horse career. The guy that I bought the Tennessee Walker from, he and I ended up good friends for many, many years. And then uh, we ended up moving from Kansas City to Colorado when I was 27. I bought a ranch. Or actually, I made a down payment on the ranch yeah. and uh, started in the cattle business. So that's um, trying to, you know, want, wanted to be a cowboy. So that's kind of how it all started. Right. And so when you started actually 
Well, at any point, I don't even know this. At any point of your career, did you actually take courses into training or were you someone that just mentored people and then did, you know, bigger clinic type things or was it? Well, the clinics didn't come for a few years. The clinic started in uh, 1980, 81, right in there. Um, we were already showing horses. Uh, Zip was a high point performance horse for the year in this club. And uh, we had done really, really well. While the, the ranching had, was going broke, the uh, interest rates went to 22%. The cattle prices went to an all-time low, it seemed like, and uh, and the uh, we hit a hundred-year drought, you know, in Colorado. So that you know, first year basically in business pretty much wiped me out. I was broke by the end of the first year, so or second year, somewhere in there. And so um, actually, that would have been the second year. So. In any case, so uh, we had the FHA started foreclosing on a lot of ranchers, and I was one of them. And uh, so we went, um, they did so many, the F, uh, FDA, uh, FHA, excuse me, the FHA was foreclosing on so many farmers, they stopped them. Well, by that time, they'd already sold my cattle, already sold all the equipment, everything I had, basically. And... Um, so I really, but they couldn't take the farm away or the ranch away. So anyway, uh, kind of a long story, I guess, but, um, so anyway, we got, uh, about that time we were, that was around 1980. Uh, I started, I went to a clinic. I well, actually, I saw this, I was delivering some horses up to my brother's ranch and, uh, we were meeting in the middle. And I saw this flyer on this, this clinic, and it sounded like it was pretty amazing. This guy could do all these things with the, these horses and stuff. And so I talked to a few of my horse show and friends and neighbors, ranchers to go. And so we drove 100 miles and went, went to this clinic. Well, the clinic was a five-day-long clinic. One of the days got rained out. And I didn't learn hardly anything great about horse training. What I learned was this was the seemed to be the most dangerous, silly things you could do, both for people and horses. And and I just so what I learned from it was how bad people wanted to learn. So from that that inspired me to give a, a clinic and so I gave a one day clinic. It was free, people could come and uh, I would fix their horses whatever the horse problem was, I'd fix it. And I did it. And so at the end of the day, this guy was so excited, he wrote me a check for $25. And it was huge. I mean, it was a huge thing uh, to me at the time because I needed the money, believe it or not. And so, so anyway, that inspired me to start doing the clinics. And then it was uh, a great life, you know, for the next 35, 40 years. Still going, actually. <laughs> yeah so how so did there you, you go <laughs> <laughs> what did that process look like did you have mentors that you learned from or how, was it by trial and error like how did you find this process that you could take horses through well the if i had a mentor and and there's going to be lots of them but if i had a mentor, mentor it would be the very first fellow I bought that Tennessee Walker or that Tennessee Walker from, and he wasn't like a great, great horse trainer or, you know, any, anything super special, but he had this uh, black Morgan quarter cross mare and he had, he could do so many things with this horse. And at the time, you know, my knowledge is really limited, but it seemed like it was amazing all the things he could do with, with this horse and um, and so what he inspired me to do or think differently was that um, you know that horses could think that you could you could really work with them and just 
basically do almost anything you wanted as far as teaching. So, and again, he probably, you know, he wasn't a super knowledgeable horse trainer, but that thought, you know, just inspired me at that moment. Then the next part of my life, you know, the cattle ranching taught me, it took, took me out of the concept of just uh, riding a horse down a trail or just, or trail riding, because that's basically what I had done before I bought the ranch. And so now the, the horses actually became partners in the work I needed to have done. I didn't have enough money, you know, to hire people and have them do all the work and wouldn't want to anyway. But so what I did, you know, is I had a horse, you know, that would, and I trained horses so that they could do any job that I needed done, you know, between the two of us, whether it, whether it was calving season, all kinds of different things. So, uh, then, you know, it started showing and then I started learning from showing. Um, and so all of those people that were nice to me and took care of me and, and told me what different things were in showing and all of that stuff that really helped. And I, so I, uh, took this horse, you know, uh, Zep, and trained him. And so during the day, you know, in the week, he was a working cattle horse. You know, he did everything on the job from irrigating to uh, pulling calves, anything that needed to be done. Then on the weekends, then um, threw him in the back of a pickup and went to a horse show uh, and started showing him. So, uh, so, and did very, very well with him, you know, in the shows. Well, one day I was working him out in the field and getting ready for the show. And, um, and I, this guy at the show, somebody at the show said, Hey, if your horse doesn't stop, you know, very good, really running backwards, really scolding and running backwards. Well, I had him really well trained. He'd back up really nice. So I took, you know, and I had this, they said, you know, you needed this running martingale, you needed this kind of bit, you had to have this kind of contraption on his head and stuff and using a quick stop or a domo or whatever. And so I'm out here working him and thinking of raining and he didn't stop well enough and I just kind of jerked on those reins and pulled him backwards. And he went backwards so fast, he fell over backwards. And, but uh, the good thing is he went so fast that he threw me quite a ways uh, back before he came down. So I just thought that is the stupidest thing I have ever seen. You know, somebody do, I can't believe it. So I walked him to the barn. At that time, I got all of the junk off of him, all the quick stops and all that junk, everything down off of the walls, all the fancy bits and stuff and took him to the burn barrel and burned him. And I decided that day, if I could not know how to train a horse with a, with a snaffle bit, just a mild snaffle bit, then I would never climb on another one. And that moment is really what changed my thinking in horse training. In as much as that things because they made sense to me, not because, you know, somebody else told me to do them or that it was a good idea. Uh, or this is how you fix the problem. And so at that point, you know, that really changed my thinking in how I approached horses uh, and what kind of equipment I could use on them. So then when I started doing clinics, the next thing that happened was I guarantee clinics, if I didn't fix your problem, if I didn't, you know, uh, get your horse to do what you wanted it to do, then the clinic was free. Well, again, you have to understand, I needed the money. So no one was going to walk out of that clinic, you know, that I didn't make that money from, you know. So I had to be able to fix the problem, whatever the problem was. But I also, you know, couldn't hurt the horse, not only for myself, but I couldn't hurt the horse for the owner. So I wasn't allowed to use methods that the owners, you know, weren't, you know, with to their horse. Then I had rules that the horse had to be 
calmer after the lesson than before it started that, you know, I couldn't get hurt and the horse couldn't get hurt. And the horse had to be more comfortable with people and more calm with people after I finished. So now I'm in a clinic. Somebody brings a problem horse. I don't know how to solve the problem. But I know I have rules that I have to follow, you know, in order to solve the problem. I can't get hurt. The horse can't get hurt. The horse has got to be uh, more comfortable and calm with people after it's over, after I work with them. So, and I had to get the job done because I needed the money. So that's kind of, you know, what, you know, was my mentor. It was my change of thinking. It was somebody inspiring a thought, you know, from the, from the beginning that horses could think and they could do things you, you, you know, work with you. Um, and do things you needed, jobs you needed to get done. So that's, uh, you know, and, and then setting rules and understanding. I mean, the final rule basically, and the first rule is that, uh, you know, when I get all done, I know that the horse is God's most favorite animal on earth. I know that. And so I always had the thought in my mind ask me why did I do that to his favorite animal mm -hmm. so by you know being able to stand in front of him I know he would forgive me for doing things wrong that I didn't know were wrong you know I knew he would forgive me for that but I felt like what he would do is when I knew it was wrong and I did it anyway he would mm -hmm. say John why I mean you already knew that was wrong to do why mm -hmm. would you do that to that horse so we all have to have rules to live by so that we know we're starting to get to the edge of the road where we're not supposed to be. You know? So that's, that's how I did it. And then I learned from, I learned from people that had just bought their first horse and hadn't, hadn't got it home yet. Honestly, I, and I learned from all the people in between and I learned from world champions and I, and I learned you know, uh, for sure from the horses, you know, people will say, you know, I learned from every single horse. Well, I'm not that bright. You know, I figured out it took me about 60 or 65 horses, you know, to figure out or learn something new. Uh, and fortunately, through the clinic years and, and uh, through all those years, I got lots of opportunities, you know, like that. I, and, uh, 60 to 90 days, you know, 60 days, I'd work, you know, six, more than 60 horses. So, uh, I had to less, a lot less than that. But, but anyway, so I did learn from the horses and I've learned from people. And, uh, so that's what, where I've, where I've come from. Yeah. I love the idea that, um, being able to learn from every experience, whether or not it was something that you wanted to put into your program or learning what you didn't want <laughs> to put in your program and how you didn't want to implement that style. Um, because I feel like people get really hard and really judgmental around things that don't look like what they do. But being in a space where you can look at it and go, well, if anything, I can learn how that looks when it happens that way and how I know I don't for my own values and the rules that I have for how I do things, it's very clear that that's not going to be how I operate. Um, so being able to pull that from every situation is very cool. And I know you mentioned Zip um, briefly, and I know he's a horse that kind of, I believe, I just always, the picture of you and Zip <laughs> everywhere that I envision when I see the books or the videos. I don't actually know the story around um, the process of him. I know he wasn't blind from the beginning, correct? He, what was that story and how was that? Oh, for no. He, he, the horse in his life or him going blind? Um, which I, one? <laughs> <laughs> I would say the point at which he did go blind, how that was for you and what that transition looked like. And I know people have those experiences where a horse that's really solid that they love, something happens and it kind of throws them off. And I believe that story with you guys 
it's really a testament to there are a lot of things that can be overcome when you have that solid of a relationship. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, Zip was 19 when he went blind. And so we had had all of those years. I bought him as a wingling about something. We had all those years together and the ranch experience, the show experience, and, and the seemed like thousands of clinics. I don't know how many, but a lot of clinics. And, uh, and so, uh, and a lot of different situations, you know, together. So anyway, when, what happened when he went blind is I was coming out of the, I was at the uh, National Western Sock Show uh, in uh, Denver. And it was winter, that's a January show. And so it was winter and I was doing demonstrations there and, and uh, our clinics with, uh, with the audience at different times during, during the shows and rodeos and stuff. And so he started to get uh, at the, or the, the barn is real damp, real cold, uh, and a lot of horses are crammed in it. Well, anyway, he started to get sick. So I called the vet. And, and it was about, that show's a long show. It's about, uh, I think, a 20-day show, 14 or 18, 20-day show. I don't remember. But in any case, he started to get sick. And uh, I'd never let him get too sick. So I called the vet. He came up the night before we left and uh, gave him a shot, gave me uh, a cold medicine shot called Nex Nexel. And... I was to give it to Zip for the next five days. So, so in any case, we left the next day for Oklahoma because I had a, a clinic uh, to do down there. So, uh, actually, a symposium in a clinic. So, anyway, so I go down there and uh, I'm supposed to give him the, the shots every day. And he had had the same medicine before. Well, anyway, on Monday morning, I walk into the, the barn. I'm going to give him his last shot, give him his last shot, and he has an anaphylactic reaction. So it almost kills him. Uh, we, uh, they were portable stalls they had set up. He knocked the, uh, he fell so hard against the stall, he knocked the stall a wall down. Uh, uh, there was, there happened to be, we couldn't get a hold of the vet. There happened to be a, uh, a doctor riding in the clinic. I was going to start the clinic on Monday morning. And so uh, she calls the hospital, the regular people hospital, and gets uh, epinephrine sent over to her in an ambulance and gives him epinephrine shot. We get him up, we get him to a vet, and he spent the next uh, four days at a veterinarian uh, place uh, outside Oklahoma City. So the next thing that happened was uh, that that week on on uh, Friday I needed to be down in Antonio because we were starting another clinic down there. So anyway, I go down there, and uh, uh, the I'm starting to uh, work in in this uh, in the symposium that weekend, and he's acting a little funny. And on Sunday, uh, you know, he's, I'm kind of doing a demonstration how you would teach a horse to come to you and walk, trot, and canter. While I'm using him, and he's in the round pen, and I, uh, I have him going around the pen at a slow lope, and he, uh, and I give him the signal to come into me, and he just keeps going, and he keeps going, and I get closer and closer and closer to him. Finally, I can touch his shoulder, and it scares him. Uh, and I thought that was pretty weird. Well, the next day, uh, on Monday, I took him out uh, and to another round pen, and I would, I, uh, an outside round pen, and I had him go, I had him across the round pen. I would walk away from him, call him, and he would come straight to me. I thought, well, he's got to be fine. And so then, uh, then I took and. Uh, uh, had him, stand, you know, round tie, walk across the round pen, and then move to uh, the side. 
by 10 or 15 feet tall dame. And what he did is he ran right to, ran a straight line right to the fence in front of him. He assumed that I was going to be in front of him no matter what. So then I started figuring out that he was blind. So going on a little bit further, of course, Texas A&M, checked him out, you know, didn't know what to do with his eyes, said he was blind, da-da-da-da-da. And, and to, uh, as I went around the country, I hauled him around to different universities and, and special vet clinics around the country. And so, um, but basically all the same answer. Well, finally, I was up in the New, Eng New England area. Yeah. I took him to university, had the specialist, eye specialist, eye specialist. And so I take him up there, and here comes this doctor out, and he's wheeling a big cart with all kinds of fancy equipment on it. He, can, he speaks pretty good broken English, but that's about it. So he does an amazing thorough eye examination on Zip. And uh, what, <clears throat> so what happened when he got all done, he looked at me and he said, John, he says he's blind and there's nothing you can do about it. But I don't want you to ever feel sorry for him. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, when most people have a, catastrophic event happening in their lives and it happens to them and it's a bad thing they they go through the why me the poor me let's say if somebody runs into him in a car and it's the other person's fault end up crippled and in a wheelchair he says they never and they, they're going to go through a period of time where they go through why me why did this happen to me and they'll justify lots of different reasons why it should not have happened to them. And it might take them six months to get through that. And he said, but their therapy never, they, they don't start really on the road to recovery until they get through that. And then they put that effort into, you know, their rehab. And he said, by that time, they've lost a lot of their physical ability to do things or coordination, whatever. And... He said, Zip never did that. He said, Zip never, ever felt sorry for himself. He never said, why did this happen to me? In Zip's mind, every horse was blind at 19 years of age. So <laughs> don't feel sorry for him. So, and I thought, what an amazing lesson. If I could apply that to my own life, you know, that when bads happen it's not about me it's not just that it happened to me it's just being here it's being alive we're going to deal with stuff no different than what we're dealing with with this coronavirus so life happens it doesn't happen just personally to us so lessons lots of good lessons from horses yeah i love that <clears throat> because I always speak to the fact that we have no control over anything <laughs> other than how we perceive things and the way we feel. Um, so I really focus on people getting aware of how they actually feel about certain situations and um, being able to have the tools to shift your perspective um, because like you said, if you spend that six months trying to figure out why it happened, you're losing that six months of your life of just being present and going, this is what's happening. My story around what's happening is going to be the thing that causes me suffering. So if I just change that story, then you eliminate all of that process that's hard and heavy and you don't lose out on the experience of being that moment. So I... Um, I love that. That came from that story. It was really good. I, um, my reason that I went to Colorado, I don't even know if I mentioned this, that I, for the people that are watching, went through the certification program in Colorado in 2004. And the reason I picked your guys's program was strictly because 
it was so simple. There wasn't, you know, 70 different things that you could pick from to put on your horse to make the magical things happen. It was literally show up with two horses, one broke, one unbroke, and a snaffle bit and a saddle, hopefully. <laughs> and then we go. Um, so I loved that you took that moment of people telling you what you needed to put on your horse, how it needed to be done, and tried it and realized from the outcome of that was, no, that's not how I'm going to do that. And being able to stand firm in your boundaries and around your values going through it, because I know there's a lot of people that get pressured by trainers, they get pressured by their peers, especially if they're showing, you know, your horse is this age, what level should it be at? And I, when I work with people that are um, creating so much tension and um, so much stress in their lives because of that stuff, I always have to bring them back to that question of why did you start this to begin with? Like, if it was when you were a little kid, why, why horses? Like, why? Because it was fun. Like, okay, well, that's not happening now. So how do we, how do we bring that back in? And it's always about just caring less about what other people think and focusing on what, what is it for me? And, you know, so I love that that experience was that for you. And it's one of the reasons that I was drawn to you guys strictly because it was, there wasn't all the extra stuff. It was like, if I can do it with this horse and this horse with just this equipment, then I can figure anything out. Um, and that's really what happened throughout that program. I really came out of that program the day that we graduated. And I don't know if you remember, but we were up at your office and I was like, just give me one piece of advice before I get thrown out into the real world. <laughs> and it was, um, be very picky <laughs> about the horses that you choose to bring in because those are always going to be the horses that continue to come into your life. So, um, I really went out and said, what do I want to do? And it was, I want to help people with horses that are really hard. And I got <laughs> really hard horses. <clears throat> oh, are you silly? <laughs> <laughs> no. And I always thought about that. You well, get what you ask for. <laughs> and, I did. and I did, but it was always coming back to, how can I break this down into such simple steps? And I think over the last, you know, over 15 years, Finally, I think I figured a lot of things out and it took me 15, you know, years plus what I was doing before being a professional trainer. And it's really about like, it's the more you can simplify it for people and horses, it's, just, it's so much easier than overcomplicating it with all of the other things that um, you can add and try to force. And I think it, for, for that story of, um, you realizing I'm, I'm not doing this and I'm cutting all of this out, it's not working, I think is um, an amazing lesson for people to, um, to take with them because it's really what it's about. It's figuring out what you feel and doing it your way and being solid in that. Um, so I love that piece of that. Um, <clears throat> um, for you, I know what is going on in our current situation with life and this virus and the transition that you guys have done from, and I know Josh is still doing the certification program. So um, it, actually, let me talk about that first and then we'll move into what you guys are doing. So where is he holding that or is it, does it look the same? Um, what does that program look like now? It, it's, uh... The certification program? Well, the certification program uh, is taught both by Josh and then also Brandy. And then, you know, she's in Phoenix and she's just an outstanding clinician and, uh, and trained really, really good. And Josh is as well, for sure. Um, and, but the, uh, both of them are, are doing great. Now, no trainer is going to be doing, especially clinician, you know, or somebody who gives, you know, like group riding lessons should not be doing very good right now. And I don't think any of them are. I think they're worried about, you know, because it's scheduled clinics that they have coming up, you know, uh, it, you know, have to be canceled. And 
of course, there's not any expos going on right now. So that hurt the industry a great deal. So I think overall, the coronavirus uh, and what his what it has done uh, with our economy and, and people and stuff, I think it's pretty amazing. I think that long term, this might be a very simple statement, but I think it'll affect us in our lives far more than uh, 9-11, and that was bad enough. So, you know, I, uh, horse training wise, you know, I've, I've got three kids that are helping people and doing great, and a couple grandkids that are just doing super in it as well. So very, very fortunate that way. Yeah, that's great. So it's good to know that there, um, I think that across the board, there's a lot of people that are trainers, clinicians are going, oh, what now? Um, because you make your living off of being near people <laughs> and taking their horses and having groups of people gather together and do this stuff. So I think for trainers in this time, it's how do I help people in the same way without actually being in their physical presence? Um, so I, I think that um, that alone is going to shift even the way people look at their programs and how they break them down into steps and how they share those with people either online or in, you know, different types of programs. Um, and I think if anything, it's going to make people take a deeper look at the processes that they're using and how to better teach them and maybe on the other side of it become better teachers even from looking at it a little deeper. Um, but for you guys now, I know you're doing a, a different business. So if you want to speak a little bit about that, um, because I think it does definitely intertwine with what is going on for people in general health-wise right now. So I'd love to hear about that piece. Sure. Um, well, we never intended on in the hemp business at, at all. Uh, we had our place up here for sale about uh, four years ago for the previous four years. And we really only in the last year of that four year period did we have people that were really interested in buying it. Um, and so we ended up uh, selling it to these four partners that were gonna come in here and grow him. Well, to me, I, I had no different, I had no knowledge between what the difference was between him and marijuana, but they, you know, they worked on explaining that to me. And so, uh, but our, my, mine and Jody's idea was we had all of our, uh, what we felt like our retirement wrapped up at this point in our facility, in our house. So the idea was we were gonna sell it, take that money, have it get a small cabin in the mountains and travel around, you know, enjoy our kids and stuff. So that was the idea. Well, these people, and they wanted uh, to grow hemp. They came in about May and, uh, and then wanted to, they didn't, uh, they wanted to put a little bit of money down on the place and, and then in December actually closed, but they wanted to grow uh, hemp down here on, on one of our pastures. So I helped them do that, et cetera. Now, again, marijuana to me, I never tried it, never got into that, uh, and just always thought it was bad. So that's all I heard about it, so I thought it was bad. So we had several marijuana stores at this time in this little town that we were in, but again, I'd never even been in them. So I was not interested in marijuana at all, you know, and I didn't know hardly anything about hemp, but I started learning more about it. Well. So around August, they asked Jody and I if we would go to this Marijuana Hemp Medical Expo in Oregon, in Eugene, Oregon, and said, no, I don't want to go. I'm not interested in it. And uh, they said, well, we would really like you to go, and we think you'll really find it interesting and all this stuff. I, said, I don't want to go. And so, uh, so they said, well, we'll pay. They ended up saying, well, we'll pay for your airfare. We'll pay for a five-star hotel, the nicest <laughs> hotel we can find for you. We'll, we'll pay your entry into the, to the, the expo, and uh, but we just want you to meet one person while you're up there. 
great, you know. So I told Jody, and I said, you know, we don't have to stay at this thing all day. We'll go far or so in the morning and then leave and go hang out with some friends we have up there. So we we go to this expo, and uh, we didn't leave it for three days. There was nothing to buy, so it wasn't like they were trying to sell you anything. It wasn't a pyramid scheme or any that kind of stuff. There was nothing there but good speakers, doctors, lawyers, or not lawyers, but doctors and scientists from Israel, doctors from around the country, uh, mothers with kids with cancer, uh, with Alzheimer's, or parents, you know, uh, kids with parents with, that had Alzheimer's. And um, it was amazing. It was just absolutely amazing. And we listened to these one speaker after another, one scientist after another, and we came home and it was, it was uh, what we learned was truly amazing. Now it didn't change anything. We still had no desire to get into the hemp business and these guys were gonna buy it, life is good. And that was in, I think early August, I don't know exactly, but somewhere in there. Well, in September, late September, Jody's going through postmenopausal stuff. And she had been, she's a nurse, she's a, uh, a heart and lung transplant nurse for 12 years, worked in the emergency room, uh, like a trauma one center for another 12 years. So she is a hardcore nurse and she tries to stay away from drugs, but she's been on these postmenopausal drugs for four years. She was on her three something years, I don't know. And she, she was taking four hormone medicines and an antidepressant. And she's walking around here in the afternoon and she feels like she's walking in a fog. She has to take naps. She's afraid to get on the freeway and drive even a short distance because she's afraid she'll get tired and have to go to sleep. So she's just, and she's having trouble sleeping and dealing with this. So she goes back to her doctor and uh, the doctor did what is normal is he just up or she, whatever, just up the medicine, all five medicines that Jody was taking. Well, she comes back from that appointment and now she's really feeling bad about herself and about what she's doing and that stuff. Well, these guys just happened to be here at that time. And when she came back to their place and they said, Jody, just try it. Just try the tincture. It won't hurt you. You won't feel it. Won't hurt you. There's nothing wrong with it. Just try it. But she was so exasperated with what she was doing and taking it. Uh, she took it. And in five days, she was off all five of those medicines. Mm -hmm. In five days. And it was just, it was absolutely amazing. It was life changing for her. And then we had, you know, the same thing happened with one of my kids and and then another grandkid that we have, you know, uh, has rets and terrible seizures. And so we got it into their hands and it really helped, you know, both of them, uh, one kid in school and the other one with the seizures. But it's still okay. We, our plans haven't changed. In December, we're selling the place. These guys are buying it. Well, in November, their partnership fell apart. They buy it. Now, we have a tore up pasture and, uh, and we're not sure what to do, whether to put the place back on the market again, go through that. And it, I just felt like God was telling us and leading us that, uh, with this pro property that maybe this is the direction we should go. He gave me a terrific vision for the property. And, and so for the last two years, we've been trying to build vision and try to make it happen. Medical wise, I can tell you every year for the last 30 years, I have gotten colds and and, and uh, I would, uh, the cold would eventually within a week or so turn into pneumonia. I'd have to go to the doctor, get a Z pack or some other type of uh, medicine for that. And, and it was just, it was hard to go through because my system, because I have asthma and or did as a kid for whatever reason, you know, it's just easy for my lungs to develop into pneumonia. Well, I started taking 
you know, the tinctures and stuff, not for that, but I started taking it, you know, for my back or my knees or whatever else hurt. And so, but I noticed, you know, last year that I haven't gotten sick for three years on this stuff. I haven't gotten pneumonia, I haven't gotten a cold, got nothing. Well, it makes sense to me, and I certainly wouldn't prescribe this as medicine for anybody. It's still even illegal for me even to, to think about doing that. But what I have seen, I have seen and researched this stuff that it works on gout, it works on arthritis, it works, it's an anti-inflammatory, but it's an anti-inflammatory that can't take too long, take it where it hurts you or take too much where it hurts you. Uh, there's nothing that will hurt you with it. Well, with me taking regularly, what I found out is it helped clear up my lungs. I didn't get colds and I didn't go, it didn't go into pneumonia. And it hasn't done it for almost uh, 36 months. I mean, so, you know, I've seen it help so many people now. Uh, and I think that, you know, since this coronavirus is, it attacks your lungs, you know, I'm hoping that, and I, if I get it, you know, I'm one of those people that are very, very susceptible to being killed by it because I'm over 70 years old. I've got lung problems, da 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 da. And so, you know, my thoughts are it helps dry me out just like Phoenix. It helps dry me out. I need to live in a dry climate. That's one of the reasons I like Colorado so much is there's zero humidity, basically. And, and so this, uh, I think it's amazing what it does. What's fun is for somebody to have a dog that has a problem, you know, like an arthritic problem or something, say, and the dog doesn't want to hardly get up, move around the house, let alone go outside and walk. Uh, you give this stuff to a dog for three or four days, it's amazing the change that it makes in that dog. It is amazing. Uh, we've given it to horses and, and uh, it, it's helped, again, same deal. It's any animal, any animal has this cannabinoid system. All of us have this system and what, it, what the CBD does or what the full plant does, it just helps feed, you know, that part of our whole system. It's amazing what it does, it, it really is. Yeah, I can definitely attest to that for the dogs because I have a dog who's, he's about 80 pounds. He's only three, but he, that dog will play ball all day long. And we have a lot of people in and out of the barn. So he literally plays ball all day long because he has somebody always available to throw that ball for him. So he actually started to have shoulder issues where he would come in and he doesn't know when to stop. So he would come in limping and I was like, I'm, he's only three, you know, this is um, crazy. And I, at the feed store down the street, we have a local company that does, um, does the CBD oil for dogs. And so I started giving it to him and within four days, he completely stopped limping. It was so fast. Um, and I just give it to my older dog just because, <laughs> because I'm sure it's helping something, <laughs> but I can definitely attest to that it was very quick. Um, and it was, so I, for a hundred percent, you know, believe in, um, that and, you know, the stigma around, well, it, knowing that it's not the same thing as taking it and, you know, altering your mental state, as opposed to know your, what you're doing is you're working with your body. That piece of that is not in there. And I think sometimes people get confused with that. Well, they do. And it's simply because, you know, we don't know, we don't know until somebody tells us, you know, and so, to give you an example, I'll give two good, I'll give you a horse example and give you another mental picture example. Let's say if we put a draft horse and a miniature horse in front of you, and I asked you what they are, you would say, well, they're horses. And I would mm -hmm. say, yes, you know, but they're, they're horses, they're both horses, but they're bred for two completely different reasons, mm -hmm. right? A draft horse is 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 built to be big, pull big loads, all of that stuff. A miniature horse, we 
want it to be small, cute, play, all of those kind of things. Lots of, it's not that you can't do all, lots of things with miniature horses, but they're certainly not going to do the same job as a draft horse. But there's, so they're both horses, but bred completely different, all right? The THC, there's 140 different chemicals in the hemp plant uh, that they have isolated out. CBD is just one of them. THC is one of them. Now, the THC is what gives you the mind-altering effect. You know, they call it a high. I think it's mostly a low, uh, you know, because people just sit around and veg out on this stuff. And, you know, it's not good. So what is the difference in the two? You know, like hemp or like there's four products that come from the cannabis plant. You have industrial hemp which is grown close together like field corn very very tall six eight ten twelve feet tall and very uh looks like bamboo almost well so that's industrial hemp and there's twenty five thousand different um, um things that you can make products right. that you can make out of that hemp um in fact the uh, sales and all the sailboats were made out of hemp. The Declaration of Independence uh, was written on hemp paper. and So, so there's lots of things that, that can be made out of hemp. Um, then you have the next products are you have recreational marijuana and medical marijuana, right? Now again, with those two, the only thing that's different between those two is the legal description of, of them. You know, medical marijuana is exactly the same as recreational marijuana. There is no difference. There's nothing different in it. So those two products really are just the same, recreational marijuana and medical marijuana. And then you have hemp on the other end. So those are the four products that come from the same plant. So those would be like the draft horse, the quarter horse, you know, the gypsy banner and uh, the uh, miniature horse, all right? So now let's turn the THC and, and understanding what the THC is, how much THC is in hemp, how much THC is in medical marijuana or recreational marijuana. But let's say you drink tea and with and in your tea, you put one sugar pack, right, in a tall glass of tea. That would be hemp. That's the amount of THC that is in hemp. Now, the second glass, what we're going to do is put 108 uh, sugar packs, you know, of, of sweet and low packs in that tea. And so that, that we would call that, you know, medical marijuana. So take 108 packages of sweet and low in one glass of tea, that would be marijuana or medical marijuana. One pack of sweet and low in a tea would be him. So there is no feeling. Mm -hmm. There's no immediate gratification. You might as well take an eyedropper of water. Uh, so you, you get no feeling from it whatsoever. Zero feeling. And as I said, you don't even know you really took it. But what happens and with some people in a day, some people, you know, depending on what they have, if they have gout, you know, then they really start to notice a difference, you know, uh, about two to four weeks into it. And so it's a, something that's very gradual with some people, depending on what hurts and why. Uh, like your knees, if your knees hurt really bad, most people, you can take it for a day or two or three days and you start to notice your, your knees not hurting as much. Uh, pain salves, it's amazing. You know, we have some just salves you put on your hands or you put on your shoulder, put on your back. And in minutes, I mean, literally in 10 mm -hmm. minutes, your back stops hurting you or your knees stop hurting you or your hands. If your hands are arthritic, all of a sudden they just feel better. Uh, it's amazing. It truly is amazing. I mean, there's no, there's no bad side effects. There's no bad side effects that have ever been proven 
shown anything with this stuff. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think um, <clears throat> that, especially for the horse trainers out there, <laughs> you know, when winter comes, everything gets much more <laughs> sore. <laughs> exactly, really. And we've used it on horses. We've got sprays. We actually can spray a pain salve you can put on a horse. Uh, it's pretty cool. It really is. Right. So your company right now, do you guys have your own line that you're producing or how do people um, find you and exactly what you are doing? Well, you can just type in johnmaya.com, go to our normal website, and then, then the company is chihemp.com. So it has, it also has its own website. So, uh, so that's how you can find it. It's just chihemp.com. And it'll take you right to our website. You can see all the different products. And, and we make them all right here. Uh, Jody makes them. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have an FDA approved or health department approved kitchen. Since Jody makes them and she's a nurse and she does all this stuff, she makes sure that it's absolutely perfect. And that's a big problem right now in the CBD market or the hemp market. And that's simply that so many people make it and they don't follow the rules and they don't test it. You know, our products are tested four or five times before they ever actually get in the bottle and on the way uh, to a person. Well, very cool. I'm, it sounds like it's just the perfect transition and it obviously happened for a reason and was put in your path repeatedly and gave you no choice. <laughs> so it sounds like it worked out beautifully. <laughs> and I love that when you, it has for sure. When you started speaking to it, you could tell how passionate you were, you lit up and it was like, there's this amazing thing. So I love that. And I love it when I can speak to people's programs that they're doing in the present moment and you can tell how much they believe in it. Um, and so I'm excited for people to be able to, if they do have problems and they see this, um, you know, and they've been searching for something because I feel like that's how that happens. They stumble upon something that they didn't even know they were going to find <laughs> in a podcast or a video or whatever. And now they can hear about that, learn about it, and then find you and know that it's a product that, you know, is tested and it's done the proper way. And because I think that is something when you start looking around, there's so many different companies and it's just gets overwhelming for people so it's nice to be able to know somebody personally that's doing it that's passionate about it and passionate about the safety part of it and um knowing that it's being done properly so i think that's really cool and i think people will be able to see that through you speaking about it which you know is amazing and i love it so um i oh I'm, we've been going for a while now okay so I'll wrap up, but if there is anything else that you want to add that you thought of, I always like to give people the opportunity to say anything um, that they might have come up with and been like, darn it, I wish I could have said that. I always check in with you. Great. Well, the, the only thing I would add with people, and, and as we learn, we don't learn what we need to learn, you know, until the last part. That's the very last part. It all comes together. So we all struggle with uh, training our horses and working with them and, and dealing with the unknown and the unknown being we don't know what to do. Uh, one of the, I think the key things that I learned in the last oh, five years uh, of training was that it was absolutely unnecessary ever to scold your horse. Uh, and what I mean by that is that whenever the horse is doing something that I don't want, rather than focusing on what I don't want that horse to do, I ask myself this question, John, what would you like him to do? What is it that you'd like him to do better? You know, would you like him to stop better? Would you like him to back up better? Would you like him to move his hindquarters over better? Would, what is it you would like him to do? And then I start focusing on what I would like him to do. I never address what it is I don't want him to do. Whenever I address what I don't want him to do, I'm going to end up in some form, some way, scolding him. 
which doesn't build a relationship. It doesn't make it better. Now, I'm not going to put up with habits I don't like, but I don't have to. Because let's say that the horse is standing too close to me. Well, then I work on, on you know, moving him away, backing him up, taking him forward. Just replace what it is you don't want him to do with something you do want him to do. Uh, something positive. Well, then what happens is more and more you're around him and he's around you. There is no scolding. He becomes not afraid, but he also, everything that he does that you don't want him to do becomes an opportunity to take that movement, take that energy and turn it into something positive that you would like him to do better. So, so there isn't a horse that can't stop better or make a prettier transition from a walk to a trot or a trot to a low. There's no horse that can't turn better than it already turned or speed up and slow down better. I really only have eight things to teach the horse. Turn right, turn left, go forward, stop, back up, speed up, slow down, left lead, right lead. That's about it. So focus on what I want the horse to do rather than any time, you know, that he's doing something I don't want him to do or scolding him through it. Every opportunity, everything that he does you know, that I don't want becomes an opportunity for me to practice something positive without anger, practice something positive to improve his performance, whatever it is. Yeah, that's so good. Um, and I feel like that goes along with life as well. When stuff starts to pop up, you can either focus on the uncertain things, the things you don't have any control of, the things that you don't want and you can get yourself into a place of a lot of stress and a lot of worry and a lot of suffering when shifting that to the, what can I be learning from this? How can I shift this? Um, you know, and what is working rather than what's not. And then everything else kind of sorts itself out the way it needs to when you've relaxed and you've released that um, pressure and that tension, I think, and it kind of I always tell people it's happening exactly how it is supposed to. Nothing isn't, nothing should be different and everything is perfect just the way it is. And whether or not you can see it right now in this moment, at some point you're going to be able to look back and go, oh, okay, that's why that happened. I get it, I get it. <laughs> right. And, and what it may be, it only happened, you know, simply because it's life and we get the opportunity to learn something through it. Right. So thank you so much. It's been so fun to be able to hang out with you. I know it's been a long time since I've seen you and I love to be able to check in with you. Um, I loved getting to hear the stories that I'd never heard. And I love seeing you guys transition into this new phase that seems like it's exactly, I think, what a lot of people need right now. So that you guys are just keep, keep on helping people in a totally different way now, which is amazing. So I love that. So I just want to say thank you. And I completely appreciate the time and everything that you guys are doing. So oh, Amber, you're very, very welcome. I'm glad you're doing so well. And, uh, and I miss, I honestly miss all the horse people. So uh, <laughs> you guys filled my life. So thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Tell everybody, tell Jody, I said, hi, and everyone's hi for me. Oh, I will for sure. All right. Have a good rest of your day. Okay. Bye-bye.